Welcome to Breaking Doctrine, presented to you by the Combined Arms Doctrine Directorate at the Combined Arms Center at Fort Leavenworth, Kansas. The views expressed here are those of the individual and do not represent the views of the Combined Arms Center, U.S. Army, or U.S. Government. Welcome to Breaking Doctrine, a U.S. Army Combined Arms Center podcast on emerging doctrine and the Army's vision of warfare. I'm Captain Wyatt Harper, and today's podcast topic covers FM 4L, Sustainment Operations. With me today is the Commander of the Combined Arms Support Command, or CASCOM, Major General Rodney Fogg, and the Director of the Combined Arms Doctrine Directorate, Mr. Rich Creed. Gentlemen, welcome to the show. Thanks, Wyatt. Thank you. So today we're discussing topics in FM 4O, which was published in 2019. CASCOM is the proponent of FM 4O, and in that publication we have three chapters dedicated to large-scale combat operations, or LISCO, and that's kind of what the theme will be today, sustainment in large-scale combat operations. So I'd like to start off with the changes that were made to the command and control relationships, both in the force structure and in doctrine itself. So Major General Fogg, sir, I'd like to start with you and and talk about why those changes were made. Uh, In 4.0, we described the operational environment in LISCO as being more lethal than any other types of operations. You know, the operations will require, quote, greater velocity and and volume in our distribution networks, end quote. So higher op tempo. The force was, and in many ways still is, transitioning our focus on persistent limited contingency operations to LISCO. These changes were made to both the force structure and within the doctrine itself. So, sir, can you start us off by addressing some of the force structure changes that were made and, and then why we made those? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, thanks, Wyatt. Uh, so, so, really some context up front. Uh, the way we were organized previous to the publication of FM30, and really 40 was aligned with uh, the operating concepts in the latest edition of FM30, And the way that we were organized was something called single logistics command and control. And so that worked well in counterinsurgency and FOB operations uh, where you didn't uh, have an enemy or a peer competitor that was contesting, you know, the lines of communication, uh, didn't have the same level of lethality, uh, long-range precision fires, um, you know, the threat of our peer competitors is going to introduce some things that we haven't seen probably since World War II. Mass casualties, uh, communications jamming, uh, and as we look at, uh, you know, the multiple domains, you know, cyber warfare and how we're going to be uh, disrupted uh, in, in the way that we can do things and support maneuver operations with sustainment. So, just very different challenges, and so in response to that, uh, and in coordination with where FM30 uh, took us, we looked at core and divisions as operating as formations instead of just headquarters. And so, uh, you know, here at the Sustainment Center of Excellence at CASCOM, we we thought through that and and say, how can we make sure that sustainment is organized in a way that will support cores and divisions? in large-scale combat operations. And so, uh, really, you, when you think about what that means, large-scale combat operations, you're potentially going to have multiple uh, divisions on the battlefield. You may even have multiple corps on the battlefield. Uh, so that's a that's very different uh, construct. It's a different way of looking at things. And so um, how should we make sure that Uh, We move away from single log C2. We move away from a more modular army to one that's very different, and we constructed ourselves in a way that helps maneuver commanders fully integrate sustainment planning and operations so that they can, you know, rapidly uh, respond to what's going on on the the battlefield. So in in 4.0, we introduced some new uh, command relationships and some new structures, and And I'll talk about those uh, for just a few minutes. We'll start with the core and the the ESC. And so the ESC in FM4.0, it indicates that it will be attached to the core headquarters. Uh, And so underneath that ESC, you potentially have 
uh, one or more sustainment brigades, and in those sustainment brigades, they have personnel uh, service, HR companies, human resource companies, financial management. They also have an organic signal company. And then underneath the sustainment brigade, CSSBs, that uh, would have uh, a supply, maintenance, and transportation uh, companies. Uh, they also potentially will have modular ammunition companies, field feeding, and inland cargo transfer companies. And so um, uh, this is important to understand that even though we move towards some new structures, which I'll talk about, we, we, we uh, keep our sustainment brigades and our CSSBs, and you'll mostly see those in the core and the theater area to be able to do theater opening and theater distribution. Uh, these sustainment brigades also might have some functional battalions attached to them, like a petroleum uh, battalion or a motor transport battalion. Um, so, so that's kind of laying out the way we saw our core space with our ESCs that were attached to the core headquarters and those capabilities, those units underneath it, which mostly will come from the reserves and they will remain modular. But in the division echelon, we did something very different because we needed to in LISCO and we assigned the, well, the sustainment brigade, and we renamed it the Division Sustainment Brigade, and we gave it more capabilities. Uh, so that DSB is now working for and assigned, not attached, assigned to the Division Headquarters. And it would have command and control of all their assigned and attached sustainment units to provide direct support, logistics, personnel services, finance, uh, et cetera, to the Division AO. And so I'll talk about the DSB in a little more detail. Uh, it was, you know, assigned a STB. It had that before. It had this organic signal capability. Uh, and then also it has a supply, transportation, field feeding, and maintenance company. And these companies uh, are organic. And specifically the supply, tr uh, uh, transportation company, and maintenance company will become lettered companies. So similar to the BSB, a lettered company, it's organic to the DSSB and the DSB. And that, that those units potentially also will have some reserve units attached because you'll need some additional capability in large-scale combat operations. Those additional units might be light medium uh, truck companies or heavy transport companies, uh, car, cargo transfer capabilities, petroleum, uh, modular ammunition companies, uh, movement control, and water support companies. And so there's a mixture here because we're a total force specifically in sustainment where we have between 70 to 75 percent of our units that are in the reserves. We, we have a core capability that works day in and day out with the division, with the division sustainment brigade and the DSSB uh, organization. And then you would bring in some modular additional capabilities from from the reserves. And so this is this is a very very different uh, organizational structure that we outlined in doctrine first, and then through uh, big army processes, uh, TAA and and you know POM processes, we were able to give it additional manning and additional material solutions. To, to add uh, to the capabilities for the division to operate as a formation on the battlefield. So that, that's a quick overview of what we did with, with our sustainment organizations within 4.0. Thank you, sir. Now, Mr. Creed, what does this mean for you? Let's say you're a division or you're a core planner. What do these changes in the force structure mean for, for you? Well, one, we were in favor of all of them. Uh, and so we had a lot of conversations with, with General Fogg and his team uh, out at CASCOM as we were going through this. And so, you know, one of the key points, and, and again, like General Fogg said, related to, um, you know, 4.0 was written as a result of 3.0. And, and so that focus on large-scale ground combat operations requires some cultural shifts in the rest of the Army, not just within the sustainment community. And one of those shifts... Uh, is this idea that sustainment is central to the conduct uh, of large-scale combat operations. It's absolutely fundamental to it. 
It can't be an afterthought. It's not something that's planned after a course of action is developed. And that means it has to be central to our operational art and planning. And so uh, not just with FM40, but, but with other books that we were working uh, on as FM40 was being developed, we wanted to make sure that that was widely understood in those publications. Uh, in a limited contingency environment, there was a tendency by many communities in the Army maneuver, my own former community, or fires, that sustainment was purely the responsibility of sustainers. Um, and when it comes to planning and, and coordination, emphasis, uh, command supply discipline, all of those things, that's, that's not just sustainers' business. Sustainment is everybody's business. So that's one uh, broad overall idea. I think in terms of the reorganization uh, and the alignment of the command and support re responsibilities, what that helps planners and commanders do um, is ensure unity of effort. Um, we've got cleaner command and support relationships that are more enduring in many cases, you know, when, when a sustainment brigade is aligned or organic to a division, for example, you get those habitual relationships that are built up. You've got people, the, the same people that show up for your training events over time and so that you, you get this greater level of mutual understanding uh, between the different communities who have to work very closely together uh, and be able to have those frank dialogues uh, as you're working through the dynamics of sustaining what, what we train to do, which is a large-scale combat. Um, so it results in better teamwork. It makes planning easier, I think. It certainly did in, in the places where we were behaving that way even before the, the doctrine formally changed. And then it allows you to, to train uh, as we fight. Yes, sir. And, and like we discussed before, sir, we, we've made force structure changes. We've made doctrinal changes. But what about a cultural change, and if that's needed? Because we have a generation of soldiers who are experienced in a coin environment, but have very limited exposure to LISCO. And to go further, might even lack the understanding of the sustainment requirements in LISCO. You know, I can tell you as a platoon leader and a company commander, I heard the phrase, we wouldn't do this downrange because they were used to the forward operating base. So how do we overcome this? Yeah, so that's, that's absolutely a concern and an issue because, you know, there's a lot of folks that have combat patches. They were very successful. They were dedicated. They sacrificed in combat. And they did it in Iraq or Afghanistan and they saw how operations were executed there. Uh, but this is a very different framework, and it's really a mindset change. When I, when I talk to audiences out there, whether it's captains, lieutenants, majors, others, uh, what I often talk about is the fact that we haven't seen what we're talking about. We have not seen large-scale combat operations uh, within the framework of what fm 3 is trying to get us to understand and describe. And so really, uh, sometimes folks, if they've been in the Army long enough, they'll, there's still a few that have been de in Desert Shield, Desert Storm, or they were in Iraq during the initial phases, and they think that's what we're talking about. No, that isn't. Uh, we're not even talking about Vietnam. We're not talking about Korea. We're talking about World War II, where you had you know, thousands of casualties, a division with four or 5,000 casualties during uh, a, you know, a specific battle, a space and time, which might be, you know, weeks long, where you have, you know, four or five, 6,000 casual casualties in that one division. And if you have a whole core on the battle space, then you can multiply that just to kind of take that as something that indicates the scope and scale. And, and when you talk about commodities on the battlefield with multiple corps and multiple divisions, and the fact that sustainment is also going to be responsible most likely to provide support to multinational allied forces, as well as our Title X responsibility and sustainment to provide uh, Army support to other services, ASOS support. And so if you look at, you know, a theater where the Air Force potentially is going to be very distributed on the battlefield, you know, 35, you know, 50, 100 different locations, 
so that they can remain safe as they can and distribute their capabilities across the battle space because of the pure threat and the fire's capabilities and the precision munitions that, that, our, that our adversaries have, we have to figure out a way to provide fuel, uh, as, as an example, to, to our corps, our divisions, down to the flot, as, as well as our Army support to other services and multinational allied forces. And so if you were to, to look at a theater and we've done the math uh, for large-scale combat operations when it comes to petroleum. And so if you think about the joint security area moving into, you know, the core support area uh, down into division and brigade support areas and supporting the offense, that's a significant challenge along with the Army support to other services. Uh, and so that's why uh, we, we thought through Class 3 bulk distribution, our mobility, and our material management and surge maintenance requirements. But really, if, if you think about our modular way of fighting counterinsurgency operations in Iraq and Afghanistan, just kind of as an example of what that means to leaders. And so let me take an excursion and think through a company commander, one that I knew that worked for seven, eight different battalion commanders within a certain space. Before they deployed and there were trainings to deploy, he worked for two battalion commanders. And then while uh, he was deployed, he worked for several others because we were plugging and playing. We were modular, and units would come in and out of a CSSB, for example. And, uh, and then when he redeployed, he had another battalion commander, a different one. And then that battalion commander changes out. So leader development and building relationships with our senior leaders as a company commander in uh, the space that I'm talking about where uh, we're executing a deployment of discrete modular companies underneath new changes, chains of command on the battlefield and ripping out new units and bringing in you know, and redeploying uh, units that have been there for a year or 15 months during the surge of, in Iraq, it was 15 months. Uh, that is not a space where we can be in under large-scale combat operations. We need a division sustainment brigade uh, that trains on a day-to-day -day with division commanders and uh, their brigade maneuver commanders. And they build that relationship and they deploy together they fight together and then they redeploy together. And so I just wanted to kind of point out some of the situations which I don't think is going to be successful uh, against a peer adversary. And if you don't mind, I'd like to talk about uh, some of the gaps as we think about sustainment and, and, and what we would need to execute large-scale combat operations. When we really put ourselves into that framework, uh, we found that uh, class Three bulk, as I, dem as I indicated before, uh, we just didn't have enough c class three bulk distribution. Um, and the DSV helps us gain some of that back, absolutely uh, helps us because we're able to build a, a petroleum company within the supply company, and it added Emmett tankers and, and fuel trailers to be able to add additional gallons of capability per division. Uh, uh, we were able to look at mobility, both tactical mobility, moving uh, people, troops, and their equipment, as well as commodities, right? You've got to be able to move ammunition. You've got to be able to move Class 4. You've got to be able to f move food and water. So that mobility was absolutely a gap. And then the echelon maintenance capabilities, what we call surge maintenance capabilities for our primary platforms, uh, Abrams and Bradleys and Strikers uh, specifically, being able to add some of that maintenance capability so that we could execute pass back and echelon maintenance uh, on the battlefield. So doctrine is powerful because we talked about what we needed uh, within the framework of FM40, and then that was uh, important to help us drive towards uh, the DOTMO PF solutions that that would require. Uh, and so ultimately, as we went through, you know, the TAA, big army, total army analysis process is looking at palm resourcing uh, for material solutions, uh, work, looking at early entry requirements when it comes to, uh, to the commodities and the mobility, mobility requirements on the battlefield uh, and maintenance requirements. 
uh, we were able to add, uh, uh, you know, a line haul company into the regular Army. We were able to add several PLS companies into the regular Army, rebalancing between the RC and the regular Army. Uh, we were able to uh, get dollars associated with buying and updating some very old legacy uh, uh, tanker systems. And so we had the very old end of useful life uh, uh, tankers for line haul and tankers for tactical distribution. And, and we're now we're in a space where uh, we're modernizing those and we will should see those being fielded within the next uh, three to five years. Um, we also looked at uh, trailers and we needed uh, to look at the overheight and overweight trailer requirements for our new platforms and we didn't have enough uh, uh, heavy equipment transport trailers so we have something called an enhanced HET uh, that we're bringing in. Uh, we also have a medium equipment trailer that we're bringing in uh, to get after some of the mobility requirements that we saw as gaps. So I just wanted to kind of touch on that for for a few minutes and and indicate right up front that the power of doctrine to drive change, it all started with putting it in FM40 and then understand the concepts that we're trying to get after and, and then modernizing our structures as well as modernizing uh, our leader development as well as modernizing our material solutions. And I just talked about a few of them. Thank you, sir. Then Mr. Creed, when when CASCOM wrote FM40, CAD supported that effort, and we do that with all the centers of excellence. But can you kind of give us some background on the process and the role that CAD played and plays in developing doctrine with our centers of excellence? Yeah, so when um, General Falk's predecessor started the, the FM40 uh, writing process back in late 2017, early 2018, um, it, we, we had to make sure that one, that what we produced was congruent with how the U.S. Army needed to fight, not how necessarily we want to fight. Uh, it gets back to the idea is, okay, we have the Army, we have. Um, and so what do we need to be able to do in large-scale combat operations against a peer threat that can contest us in all domains, and what, what are the sustainment implications to that? I think our value uh, here was... Uh, making sure that the solutions that, that General Fogg's team came up with were congruent with a combined arms approach and that they would be integrated uh, within the Army, across the Army, and then in terms of being integrated with the larger joint force. So, so that's one point. I think um, that combined arms perspective, you know, we did a series of tabletop exercises uh, using the initial draft of, of, of FM40. Uh, out at CASCOM, and, and General Fogg hosted those. And, and, and so we had the entire sustainment community, 06 and above, of subject matter expertise in the room. Um, and working through different scenarios and, and talking about each of the, the components of sustainment, uh, working our way through the book, and, you know, the draft of the book. And, and, and what we all learned and relearned again is that writing doctrine is an iterative process. So you're going to start with something, um, and then as all the smart folks in the room with a wide diversity of experiences um, get a chance to, to say, hey, that's not exactly what we want to do, or you know, we don't need so much information on this, we need to focus on, say, logistics or, or casualty evacuation. You know, and, and, and so all of that. I think, though, um, one thing that we were able to bring, and, and I'm a retired armor officer, uh, and old school armor officers, and I'm old enough to be old school, um, sustainment was your secondary branch. You know, you were all quartermaster or ordnance officers, depending on the different jobs that you got assigned. And, and one of the things that had happened in the Army over, you know, about a 20-year period was that as our focus went away from large-scale combat operations, we also modified the Army. And so um, General Fogg talked about we, we had a force, that this modular force, and it was organized and, and equipped to do certain things, and then we went to war in two different places. Um, and we never really got a chance to test that modular force in the environment that the Army needed to adapt uh, its readiness towards, which is large-scale ground combat operations. Um, 
And so this, the, the junior folks, that, that generation that, that you talked about, Wyatt, um, they didn't get a chance to do their jobs in that in environment, uh, even though those organizations were at least originally designed in some way, shape, or form to do that. So we never got a chance to test them out. And so when we're at those tabletop exercises, because of the, the, the relative seniority of the people in the room, we actually didn't have um, too many people in the room that had actually done the things that we were discussing uh, in the doctrine. They had never done them themselves. Um, and so I think our value was uh, me as a former uh, Armor Brigade Combat Team S4 for a couple of years and a former support platoon leader at the end, tail end of Cold War days, where you were actually executing some of these tasks uh, under the conditions that we were talking about. Uh, I think that was valuable to kind of help people visualize. Because like General Fox said, because most people had never done this before, or if they did do it, they did it at such a junior rank, um, that the experiences, you know, they're relevant, but they not, may not be as relevant to, say, a division or a core as, as we need the doctrine to address. Um, so helping the folks to visualize how one of those types of fights might go down and, and what are the things that we need to anticipate, uh, that, that we need to think about, that we need to be able to adapt to, uh, again, given the Army we had uh, or we have at the, at, at the moment. And I think um, this introduction of historical vignettes back in the doctrine has been very helpful because that helps people visualize uh, those scenarios that General Falk talked about in terms of, you know, hey, in World War II when we were talking sustainment or CASLVAC uh, or any of these types of things or, or, or different logistical commodities, what are we really talking about? How do you visualize that? And then I think the other bit is, um, you know, General Lundy was the CAC commander, and he and I had a couple of conversations uh, a few years ago about this, but sustainment needs a maneuver champion. There needs to be champions in the other communities uh, for sustainment so that everybody in the Army understands how important it is, and, and, and General Fogg and his team are not the ones that are advocating just by themselves or with the AMC commander or the Army G4. The whole Army needs to understand this uh, and, and why it's important. Uh, and so I think General Lundy was, you know, one of the great sustainment champions in, in recent years in our Army. And I think that had a positive impact, not just on the doctrine development, but following through uh, in, in terms of organizational change and, and resourcing. Uh, that gap study uh, was something that he did on behalf of the Army Chief of Staff. And going into that, you know, uh, many people were making decisions about resources in the Army based on anecdotes or assumptions that were no longer true. Hey, the Army's 490,000 people. Uh, it was 490,000 people in 2000, so it's the same size Army, so we can do the same things we could do then, and that was not true. And nowhere was it true or uh, more untrue than perhaps uh, in the sustainment warfighting function. Uh, so I think those, uh, those contributions, I think, from us is, is, is what helped uh, General Fogg's team. I don't know, sir, did, did I miss anything? No, I mean, you're spot on. Uh, we, you can expect uh, people in sustainment or intel or pick a warfighting function to tell you what they need within their specific warfighting function. But if you have a maneuver, you know, those are enabling warfighting functions. But if you have maneuver senior leaders that advocate for it, uh, it is powerful. So I totally agree. And I'd also like to add, you know, uh, to the question of uh, the fact that we want to refight the, the battles we were just in. We want to refight the war the way we did it before because that's where we're comfortable. And so what FM3O did was make the Army, make us all uncomfortable with putting ourselves out of what we understood and knew and actually executed on the battlefield counterinsurgency FOB operations, and we had to think differently. And really, uh, FM-30 was large-scale combat operations, and what we're going to do in the next iteration, looking at concepts associated with multi-domain operations, forces us to be more futuristic, more innovative in our thought. And so, um, to your point about uh, we have a lot of junior leaders or mid-level, mid-tier leaders 
who executed coin operations and, again, uh, very valuable, and it's what the nation needed at the time. But as a CSSB commander during the Iraqi surge, I had, as an example, 18 units that ripped in and ripped out uh, while I was in command for 15 months, 18 different units. And as an example, maintenance units would come in and not execute maintenance. Rather, they would come in and execute uh, combat logistics patrols, CLIPS, because that's what we needed. And so they would train under r for gen uh, and where training is being fed to you, equipment solutions are being given to you, and contractors on the battlefield executed uh, really the core sustainment functions. And contractors could do that. Contractors could deliver us bottled water. Contractors could give us great dining facilities to eat at on the FOB. Uh, but what we're thinking about is a very different, lethal, high-op tempo uh, battlefield uh, where uh, the enemy fires and precision munitions capabilities are going to force us to be more expeditionary, force us uh, to be in the dirt and to be dispersed, force us uh, to do things in a very different way because we're going to be contested uh, from every direction uh, as we execute and, and win on the battlefield. And so sustainment has to respond to that. Maneuver has to, all our warfighting functions have to respond to that. And then we also have to, and we have, looked at how we train the force to try to, try to change this concept that we'll just do it the same way we did it before. And so we've executed some aggressive messaging campaigns uh, we've looked at our AIT and, and really more so our professional military education, our PME training for platoon leaders, company commanders, our support operations course, and we've added rigor into all of those uh, courses here within the institution uh, with challenging scenarios that you know, really drives logistics and sustainment challenges and, and forces problem solving at the tactical level. And so uh, really we've got to get our whole force to transition in this direction. And for sustainment, it is absolutely about building and sustaining combat uh, power on the battlefield so that we can enable maneuver commanders to seize, retain, and exploit the initiative. And, and so this is a very different thing than what we did before. And it's really hard to elevate ourselves out of Hey, uh, you know, the way we executed uh, during uh, coin operations is what we're going to do in the future because it's not. Hey, you know, the good news, though, sir, you know, since we went to, you know, they call them the full spectrum rotations at the combat training centers, and then they call them decisive action rotations. I think we still call them that. But since about 2014, 2015, you know, those officers or, or NCOs that were relatively junior then are now up, approaching, you know, field grade uh, levels of experience. And the captains, um, you know, they might even be getting close to becoming battalion commanders in some cases. Those folks have gotten the right repetitions, right? Now, they may not have had all the tools to work with because, you know, we hadn't made some of those organizational adjustments yet. But... I think we're getting there. We're starting to close that gap. It's just, you know, the gap's moved higher as opposed to lower. Um, because I'll tell you, to me, when you're working sustainment things as part of a formation, you're a distribution plat platoon leader, for example, understanding how you fit in at Echelon, um, you know, everybody's got to be able to do their job. And, and so um, every distribution platoon and, and uh, every brigade and every division has got to be able to do the things that they do or the whole uh, operation kind of grinds to a halt or that critical part of the operation doesn't occur uh, on schedule or in the right place. Uh, and, and so what that drives us back towards, at least from our perspective, this being the Combined Arms Center, is the absolute, absolute criticality of subject matter expertise. I mean, true branch subject matter expertise. So. Yeah, I I agree, uh, Rich, and, and, you know, we have, we coordinate with the, the, uh, the CTCs, the DIRT CTC 
agencies. We get their trends. We understand the space we in, we're in. And they're absolutely training things differently, and it's very positive. But we still have a lot of things to overcome. I mean, when we think about, you know, on a FOB, you didn't have to worry about concealment and displacement. You didn't have to worry about, you know, because you already had your crew serve weapons set up. You already had your entry point kind of set up when you, when you, you know, ripped into a, a new location in Iraq or Afghanistan as a company commander. And now at the CTCs, at NTC or JRTC, uh, you know, they do have to think about, um, you know, how to establish uh, your defensive positions, put up three-strand Constantina wire to standard, placement of your NVDs, you know, the fighting positions, range cards, your anti-tank uh, weapons capabilities, obstacle emplacement, all these things are, are really important. You got to be able to protect yourself, job one, to be able to execute your mission as a sustainer logistician. I'm glad you mentioned that, sir, because I was going to save this for later, but I think now it's a, it's a perfect time to talk about the topic of risk. You know, balancing security and sustainment, which is a logistician's problem. Whether we're talking about the brigade support area or the division support area, that sustainment footprint is a large target. And defending those areas always seems to be an issue, whether it's an Iron Mountain or not. And not only defending those areas, but also defending the lines of communications from those support areas all the way to the forward line of troops. You know, I've heard the phrase, every gun shark I have in my convoy means one less fueler I got. How are commanders balancing the ability to sustain a fight while protecting itself? Yeah, so so it's absolutely a, a challenge and and within you know sustainment i'm always concerned about our ability to execute uh, tactical convoy operations to be able to move along these extended lines of communication delivering the commodities that's required that pipeline of commodities whether it's class five class three etc uh, is what uh, enables enables you to keep tempo uh, and, and to move forward with, you know, your offensive operations. And so really the, the soft underbelly of our United States Army and what our adversaries are absolutely going to target, whether it's in competition, trying to move to a theater, uh, or whether it's once we're there and we're, we're trying to supply the Army to be able to execute uh, its op- concept of maneuver, um, is the target sustainment. If you can prevent... You know, the fuel from arriving, if you can prevent the ammunition from arriving, then we can have the best, most modern combat systems and platforms. We can have the SEP V3, or we can have the IRCA. We can have other, uh, you know, absolutely necessary modernization to our Army, but they're no good on the battlefield if you can't fuel them and if you can't give them ammunition and if you can't make sure your soldiers have food and water. Uh, So... So it's really critical. That's why I say it's job number one to be able to protect yourself so that you can execute your mission. And so I would submit to you that commanders have to understand, number one, the maneuver concept of the operation. They have to have their planners absolutely embedded with our maneuver uh, planning uh, elements, the threes of the world, the support operations, XOs, division staff, brigade staff, you you can't do sequential uh, planning. You have to do parallel planning. And when something changes on the fly, you've got to be able to uh, have the adaptability to make changes in route. Uh, and so that uh, that kind of planning factors, there's a lot of planning factors in FM uh, 4.0 that talks about offensive operations, defensive operation, consolidating gains, uh, you know, displacement of the of the DSA or the BSA and kind of what are the factors that, that help you make those type of decisions. And, of course, it's, it's a combined arms fight, right? And you've got to understand all the other war fighting functions, intel, as an example. And so your intelligence capabilities within your sustainment organizations to help you understand and assess threat and to be able to respond to that threat appropriately uh, the pre-planning that's required to execute a displacement. You, if you're not going to the field and displacing your D, your BSA before you go to NTC, you're probably at a huge disadvantage. 
And that's just one example of home station training and how critical that is. Um, echelon movement of a BSA or a DSA, you're not going to move in one lift. It's going to be multiple lifts. And how do you prioritize link to the maneuver concept of the operation, the maneuver commander's main effort? If you're going to put together forward logistics elements to kind of move and to make sure that you're supporting maneuver and fires, you know, why are you putting them together? Where are you pushing them to? How do you task organize them and command them appropriately and keep uh, communications to have that common operating picture of where you have capabilities on the battlefield? And then uh, to understand, uh, you know, the support coordinating uh, measures, the, the operational control measures. Sometimes sustainment officers, especially junior officers, don't understand these operational control measures and, and they, they often, you know, get into a place uh, that disrupts the, the whole operation because they don't understand uh, maneuver as well as they do uh, sustainment. I want them to be technical experts, but first I want them to have the ability uh, to coordinate and operate uh, with maneuver organizations. We, we recently talked about reorganizing our, uh, our BOLIC course. And really, uh, our thought process as we looked at that is to move away from some of the uh, technical training and move towards what, uh, what we think might be the most demanding job that a platoon leader would be uh, placed in. And so what we came up with, and I think it's probably correct, is uh, if you're going to go be a platoon leader in an FSC of a uh, ABCT, and so I'm going to be in this armored force, and I'm going to be in the... Uh, Ford support company, I'm a, and I'm a platoon leader. If you can operate successfully and understand that space, then I think you can go to any other sustainment organization and be just fine. I'd agree with that, sir. I tell you, as a lieutenant, the hardest job I had in the Army was, it might have been the hardest job I had in the Army at any rank, was being a support platoon leader in an armor of the time. Uh, and HHCXO is a similar thing, and so they're set up differently now in those maneuver units. Um, but that level of, of expertise and, and identifying those individuals with that kind of talent who are good good at it and it can bring those talents to bear, you know, when they get to higher levels of responsibility, boy, that's a really big deal. Thank you, sir. I'd like to shift now to a topic about tactical sustainment, specifically the roles in the in the rear area. You know, we're hearing stuff coming from, from guys out of Warfighter about this. And even on an earlier episode of Breaking Doctrine, we discussed consolidation of gains with some leaders from the Mission Command Training Program. Um, specifically, the Maneuver Enhancement Brigades, or the MEBs, have come up frequently. And in the context of sustainment, one organization may own the terrain, but others, like a ESC, like an Expeditionary Sustainment Command or a Division Sustainment Brigade, will be there as well. And there are some conflicts that can, that can come up, for example, like movement control. Can you give us your thoughts about sustainment operations in the rear area? Yeah, so, so I think, again, it's probably helpful to think about uh, the core formation and the ESC and potentially uh, what that might mean for, for, you know, the core area, the core rear area. Uh, as well as the division, the division rear area, the sustainment uh, brigade, the brigade, and, and how all those things link together, I think is probably good context. And I'll, I'll just kind of start with the ESC commander, again, being attached to a core and how important that is. And if you think about uh, the rear area operations that the core may uh, be uh, challenged with, it could include uh, stability operations, working with civilians, uh, trying to reestablish uh, essential services uh, to the populace. Uh, you might have bypassed, uh, you know, in the division space or the core space, you might have bypassed enemy forces. And so it doesn't mean that you're because you're in the rear area, there's not uh, kinetic activity. And so how does an ESC commander work with the core DCGS? How does the, uh, you know, uh, sustainment brigade commander in a division work with the division DCGS in that rear area to be able to uh, understand uh, how to control fires, how, how to control airspace, 
and, and who is doing that? And then also uh, for the sustainers, how do you make sure you continue to have um, that uh, pipeline of commodities, movement control, prioritization? Uh, so there's, there's a lot of board sales, working groups. There's, there's lots of ways that we kind of organize, organize ourselves to be able to do this. But again, I can't overemphasize the importance of sustainers understanding maneuver. And so they've got to be able to anticipate how terrain potentially affects the rear area, how the fire support coordination measures are important, movement restrictions that may affect operations, whether it's displaced civilians on the battlefield and how that might uh, be a factor. Um, how do you uh, understand uh, the and assess and communicate troop movement and resupply operations and prioritize those things. Um, and I think the key leaders that are in the core space and in the division space is that partnership between the DCGS and either the ESC commander or the DSB commander. Because the DSB commander, the ESC commander, we don't expect them to control fires or uh, to have terrain management, uh, there's some tasking authorities that the DCGS is going to have, fires, coordination, airspace, as I indicated, and, and then you have your sustainers concentrating on that pipeline of commodities, the throughput of Class 5, the Class 3 bulk, the food and water that's necessary uh, to keep our uh, operations moving forward, whether we're going to move into a defense or whether we're continuing our offensive operations. And so you want them concentrating on that. And I think there's there's that teamwork and that rear operations framework uh, that really I think is atrophied, uh, again, linked to COIN, uh, that we've got to get after. And I know there's a lot of structural things, so there's a lot of doctrinal uh, updates that we're doing in that space. And so, uh, Rich, I don't know if you have something to add there based upon what I indicated. Oh, yes, sir. I, I'm in violent agreement. But there are there are some things. And um, in this case, I think the doctrine is probably leading our, uh, and driving some organizational change that will be helpful. So we talked about uh, deep, close, and rear areas uh, for, you know, almost 30 years up to a point. Then we started changing names around a little bit. Uh, the current doctrine talks about deep, close, uh, security and consolidation areas, uh, and, and really that's because we were constrained with the words we were, we were going to use. We didn't want to change everything too much too fast. But I think we're, we're over that hump now, so um, in the next FM30 and the current FM394 that it should be out in a week or two, we talk about deep, close, rear, and support areas. And so whether you're talking about a division or a core, you know, all of that space between where the brigade combat teams are, are conducting close combat and then the rear boundary of the division or the corps, that entire area, that physical space, is now going to be called the rear, uh, the rear area. And both corps and divisions, um, divisions and corps, they currently call them support area command posts, but that, that, that's changing in the doctrine to rear, com to rear command posts, um, and the organizations will catch up. But what we found out is that there needed to be somebody at that echelon at that, for that formation that was commanding and controlling the wider geographical areas. And, and that support area is, you know, unlike you've pointed out several times now, it, it's not like a coin fob. Uh, and, and we use the terms base and base clusters, but in a, particularly in offensive operations, which would be the most stressful uh, on sustainment, they're really tactical assembly areas. And all those things you do in a tactical assembly area to secure yourself, uh, to prevent detection or minimize detection and so forth, uh, all those things have to take place there. But something that our combat training centers, the dirt ones, don't represent very well because of the size of the formations that you know, the training audience is a brigade with, with, with you know four, five, six battalions. Um, if you were to stand on Hill uh, 381 in Central Corridor, and look forward during a fight, you'd see all the battalion, uh, you know, tactical assembly areas and, and fighting positions and, and all of those kinds of things. There's a lot of hustle and bustle. Uh, but if you were to look backwards, you wouldn't see a whole lot unless there were some, some Hemets pushing a log pack or something 
and maybe some retrans uh, between you and, and the brigade support area. The same would be true perhaps in a division, uh, if, if there was a division node out there for the training event. But everybody that's been to a warfighter and you see all the, you know, that's an electronic simulation. And, and so, but you see all these icons all over the map. And so if you were doing that in real life and you were to look behind you, there would be uh, pretty much every flat space, every bit of usable terrain would be uh, gainfully employed by somebody. Uh, and there'd probably be some forces either transiting uh, that area or, uh, or occupying it. And someone needs to, to be responsible for that. If, if the division or the core command post is not re responsible for that, then you are encumbering uh, the sustainers uh, in terms of what they focus their command and control efforts on. They should be focusing their command and control efforts on enabling freedom of action for that division or core. Um, they've got more than enough to keep them busy. So outside of you know, local security um, and protecting yourself uh, against detection, uh, it's the responsibility of that higher echelon to do that. And so that maneuver enhancement brigade is supposed to command and control uh, those aspects of the, the uh, support area um, to enable that sustainment brigade or battalion commander uh, to do what needs to be done in terms of sustaining the force. And so it's a cooperative endeavor, but you know it becomes broader in terms of focus the further up you move in the echelon. So sustainers should be focused on the sustainment and the command control of their formations. And then that, that terrain owner has got to be organized and equipped to do that airspace management, to deconflict fires and so forth. But somebody, and that's what the rear command posts do, um, they're not just managing terrain, but they're deconflicting the employment of terrain. And, 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 you know, that commander sets priorities in terms of movements and so forth. Because we really haven't talked about, you know, some of the really fundamental differences other than scale and scope uh, associated with, with the large-scale combat operations. But, you know, math matters. I mean, mathematics is hugely important to everything we do, whether you're talking about time considerations or distance. And, and time and distance are, are, are very closely related. Uh, in, in terms of sustainment. And so someone has got to be controlling who's moving up, who's moving back, who's got priorities on these routes because, you know, some of the training uh, areas, you know, they have multiple choices on routes. In some places where we'd operate in a Korea, your, your choices of uh, main supply routes or older supply routes are, are, are relatively constrained. And so I think that's a, a big deal, and, and I think every time we do a warfighter, the divisions and the corps get better at, at sorting through, you know, maybe what the doctrine needs to say in terms of who's responsible uh, for what. But the doctrine won't account for every possible scenario, and that's why we have this neat idea of task organization and, and this ability to shift authorities and responsibilities so that we're taking the appropriate uh, approach uh, in a particular context. And then I, I think the other thing that I, I don't think we can emphasize too much, sir, is that the importance of drills. Um, to be able to move quickly and, and to react uh, quickly enough to uh, survive uh, a, a contact with, with whatever threat we happen to be talking about, the reaction to that threat's got to be as close to automatic as, as could possibly be. And, and, and we do that through drills. And, and so while maneuver formations have actions on contact and so forth, well, sustainment formations have been training that as well. And, and that's hugely important. Um, because this idea of making yourself uh, a less lucrative target is, is hugely important. Uh, we say in all our doctrine now that friendly forces are always in contact, at least in the electromagnetic spectrum. And when you're talking about peer threats, you're being observed from outer space. Um, people can you know, see your emissions. You've got UAVs flying all over the place looking for those critical sustainment nodes. Um, because again, as you said, you know, that, that armor brigade combat team's not going very far eight hours after its last uh, refueling, right? And so uh, all of those things, I think, are hugely important considerations uh, when we talk about this stuff. Hey, uh, so, that, uh, so just to put it in the context, I know we're talking about rear operations, but talking about the ESC commanders and the division 
uh, the sustain, a sustainer brigade commander or, or a division sustainer brigade c commander, and those are your senior logisticians, your senior sustainers within the corps and within the division. And if we put it in the context of, of what many of us think is the most difficult, most complex mission set uh, that could be given, which is a wet gap crossing, which, you know, depending on how many gaps you're looking at or the size and the scope of, of the mission, it can be a division level mission or it could be a core level uh, main effort, you know, uh, assigned to a division to execute with all the organizations that that are required to do that, to be able to, uh, you know, have that senior sustainer uh, operating in, in that uh, rear command and control element and thinking through that very complex, difficult mission set and what you are going to pri prioritize. And, and the combat configured loads associated with class five and class four uh, to be able to uh, uh, obscuration, uh, you know, fires or uh, multiple gaps, the main efforts, the maintenance and recovery requirements, uh, like you indicated, the movement control, uh, which is an operational requirement. Sometimes people might, you know, think of that as a, as a, a sustainment commander requirement. Of course, they're very important there, but that's a three function. Uh, and especially when you're thinking about whip gap crossing, advanced to the gap, assault across the gap, advance from the far side, secure the bridgehead, and then continue the attack. And I'll focus on continue the, the attack. And that senior sustainer being able to understand how to prioritize those commodities to be successful, the, the throughput that potentially would be required so that we can have that freedom of maneuver uh, that speed and the momentum required to be successful on the far side and to continue the attack, which is very difficult. So what what it also brings to mind is what every lieutenant, uh, captain, major, lieutenant, colonel, if you're and, and above, if you're in sustainment, the, the aged old calculus uh, required to anticipate requirements. So what is the mission? Again, parallel planning with the maneuver concept or the wet gap crossing mission uh, with your staff, understanding those requirements. What are, my, what are my capabilities to execute against those requirements? So, and then where do I have shortfalls and how do I, you know, mitigate those shortfalls with getting support from rear sustainment organizations and echelons and doing that ahead of need. And so that is the calculus that every sustainer should understand, requirements, capabilities, and shortfalls, and how am I going to mitigate those shortfalls so that we can be successful. Uh, so, so the way we structure our command control, uh, command posts, and what uh, information is provided there is a common operating picture and the understanding of, of the priorities of our maneuver commander uh, is absolutely critical to success. Well, I think educating the maneuver commanders too, right, sir? So you're doing course of action development and, and you've got some sort of super ambitious timeline, whether you're trying to move in a period of darkness, for example, or um, I've got some pressure from above, you know, whatever the pressure is that says I need to get objective A by this day, uh, whatever it may be. The, the, the potential, the, the moral courage necessary for those potential conversations about what can be done and not done with what's available and then what needs to be available if you want me to get this done. Uh, you know, we call that a dialogue, right? But it, it can be quite an emotional event. But that gets back to people trusting in the subject matter expertise of the folks that are giving them advice. Uh, and I think that's part of this idea of making sustainment essential to the operational art, right? I shouldn't be coming up with plans that can't be sustained. Um, and you can't just say, hey, this is the plan, figure out how to sustain it. I mean, that's, that, that's a recipe for failure. Well, so, so Rich, that's spot on, and, and you're absolutely right. You, you've got to have the buy-in. You've got to be, you know, competent. You've got to be the expert, and you've got to get a seat at the table, and you've got to voice your concerns uh, based upon the analysis and how you're going to support and enable an operation 
And if you see gaps, you've got to be able to identify that to your maneuver commander up front so that it can be planned for. And so that's a really critical, uh, you know, uh, comment that you just made. I appreciate that. Sir, as we come to a close, I'd like to ask one more question about the Logistics Civil Augmentation Program, or LOGCAP. You know, in OIF and OEF, LOGCAP really closed some sustainment gaps, and in some cases, maybe it made more sense. But I'm curious to how LOGCAP is going to play out in LISCO compared to a coin fight. You know, what does that look like for green suit sustainers? Yeah, so LOGCAP is uh, and contracting on the battlefield. We've been doing that, you know, Today's the 246th birthday of the Army. We've been doing that yeah. since 1775. So, yeah, we're going to continue to contract on the battlefield. But, but we, but uh, in the counterinsurgency fight, we haven't. We had an over reliance on contracting, and and we've got uh, that that that's a space we've got to pull ourselves out of. We got to understand with a peer competitor, uh, with the fires capabilities, the precision munitions. Uh, contractors are not going to be uh, willing to go into the threat ring. And so where is that threat ring? Well, it's extended from where it was before. Um, and so we've got to have green suitors that can execute the maintenance on our uh, future robotic systems. They've got to be able to execute the maintenance on our set V3s right now where we use contractors. And I, and I think it's just a, uh, a failed concept to think that uh, we're going to have contractors at the level we did during COIN in large-scale combat operations. And so we're doing a lot of things right now to change some policies, to uh, look at and, and coordinate with the, with the uh, cross-functional teams and the modernization efforts that the Army's going through to make sure that we, as one example, as there's more than one, uh, that we have uh, green suit maintainers that will be able to maintain uh, those platforms forward of the enemy threat ring. Uh, when we think about Class Three bulk and, and log cap and and the what we called white trucks on the battlefield in Iraq and Afghanistan, they were absolutely critical and and they were needed and we used them and it was appropriate. But guess what? The while we had IEDs, they weren't the lines of communication weren't weren't contested at the level that they're going to be contested in LISCO. Uh, so we need that's part of the class three bulk gap that I talked about previously, and having enough uh, tactical and on haul green tankers forward of the threat ring. We're still going to contract white trucks in the joint security areas, but potentially in the core rear, uh, we can still have contracted capabilities. But forward of that is going to be an issue, and we've got to pull ourselves out of this over reliance, in my opinion. Mr. Creed, what, what are your thoughts on this? No, we're we're in complete agreement, sir. That that's this idea of the the threat ring, right? So we talked about always being in contact in in the EMS, but you know there are actually lethal weapon systems that can reach out hundreds of kilometers, if not a thousand kilometers, and so you know the means by which we operate uh, is going to be largely in, uh, informed by those threats, and and when we when we know those are credible threats. Um, you know that adaptation is going to be hugely important, not just on the whether it's law cap or not, but you know what we're doing ourselves. Again, to present ourselves as less lucrative, uh, you know, targets for those high-end, exquisite uh, threat capabilities. Okay, well, gentlemen, you know that about wraps it up for the day. But I just want to give you another opportunity. Is there anything that I missed, I didn't cover, that you'd like the audience to to hear? Thanks, Wyatt. So two things, uh, real quick, and so. Sustainment is a total force, total Army game. RC readiness is absolutely critical. Uh, the way we train and fight uh, must always consider the total force. And so I just wanted to emphasize how important the reserves are to our Army and to sustainment. Um, and then to think about the future for just a second and to make a few comments as we look at Waypoint 2028 and, and the MDO Ready Force for 2035, you know, the, the LISCO gaps is really what we're looking at, the Division Sustainment Brigade uh, for the Waypoint Force of 2028, uh, focusing on fuel mobility, maintenance, and material management, uh, which I talked about. But for the future, uh, the MDO Ready Force of 2035 
uh, focused on speed, range, convergence of effects. Uh, we have some some a uh, couple of things. We have concepts that we're looking at right now. The uh, joint concept for contested logistics (JCCL) that's linked to the joint warfighting concept, and then we also have, to have some S and T priorities that are linked to that. And so, some of the things that we're we're thinking about, because in competition, and just like you said, we're we're in contact right now in the competition uh, phase. Uh, you know, cyber operations are ongoing all the time. So, setting the theater and being able to have capabilities forward where we need them, having a uh, resilient and integrated logistics command and control capability, um, uh, assured power projection. How do we project ourselves from CONUS, from the strategic support area forward, and, and how we do that while we're being contested? And then delivering sustainment in a di distributed way uh, to be able to protect ourselves on the battlefield. Uh, those are some challenges of the future. And as we look at some of the S&T priorities within sustainment, um, you know, advanced manufacturing, how can we, you know, print the parts that we need forward instead of waiting on the supply chain? Alternative water uh, sources, be able to produce water at the point of need. Uh, autonomous ground and aerial resupply capabilities. Uh, ammunition that uh, is packaged in a different way so that we can move it quicker, uh, uh, and then advanced power solutions. You know, how can platforms be energy producers as, as uh, opposed to requiring more fuel, more fossil fuel on the battlefield? And so those are some of the S&T priorities linked to the future challenges. And so I just want to kind of point those two things out as kind of my last comments. And I really appreciate uh, both of you. I appreciate uh, this series, uh, Breaking Doctrine, and uh, I hope it's useful to the audience out there. Thanks very much. Hey, sir, thanks uh, a lot. Uh, you know, we've been friends a long time, and I really appreciate you taking the time and your busy schedule. I know you're getting ready to move on. Uh, I wouldn't say better because there's nothing better than command, but you're, you're, you're heading up and being rewarded for your outstanding leadership. I'd just like to leave our audience with a request and maybe even a challenge. And that would be, it would be great if our uh, younger sustainment uh, and maneuver leaders would collaborate with each other to engage the force with a professional dialogue by writing articles, you know, participating in the online discussion forums, those blogs and so forth, and then reaching out, whether it's to CASCOM or to us here at the Combined Arms Doctrine Directorate, uh, with feedback and ideas uh, and, and anything that we can do to make both our doctrine, our tactics, tactics and procedures, or even our organizations better uh, if you've got good ideas. And, and I think that if, if, if we could get, just get a handful of people to do that, that were listening to us today, that would uh, pay big benefits for our Army. Hey, I, I appreciate you saying that, uh, uh, Rich. And, and so honestly, uh, uh, just to foot stomp it, we've seen some articles, we've had some Division DCGSs who have sent articles that ca captains and majors have produced, uh, you know, within their divisional footprint, and we've listened to them. And so some of our force design updates are going to include changes based upon good analysis and articles by junior leaders. And so uh, what you said is powerful, and it's not a waste of time. We are listening. That's great, sir. Fantastic. Thank you, sir. And, and thank you to our audience that's listening. We're continuing to grow this podcast with every show, so we really appreciate the feedback that we get. Um, so you can follow us both on Apple and Google. You can find us on YouTube and Facebook and Twitter. We're going to be putting more content up there. Um, I'd also like to say that the views and opinions expressed here don't necessarily reflect the views of the U.S. Army or the U.S. Army Training and Doctrine Command or the Combined Arms Center. I'm Captain Wyatt Harper, and this is Breaking Doctrine.